Um, uh, my name is Jens Zaxbo, and I've been here before and I always give technical talks. And this year I thought I'm going to try and do something a little different and tell kind of my story of how I got into uh, the Linux kernel and maybe offer up some perspectives on what it's like to be a maintainer, but also uh, to be a contributor to the kernel. So um, feel free to interject throughout the talk and ask questions. Uh, I don't mind. In fact, I prefer like kind of an interactive session. So if there's anything, raise your hand. The microphone's going to fly, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, take it from there. So early days, um, how I got started in Linux, I was... I was a DOS user uh, back in the day, and I'm afraid I'm probably going to say back in the day a lot, since I feel like I'm a little bit of an old fart. At least I'm not the oldest here, and I think my son is in the audience, who's probably the youngest here. But back then, I was programming uh, using Borland, Turbo C, and Turbo Asim in DOS. And that was, uh, that was fun. It was a new experience for me. I got started on a Commodore 64, but doing a DOS uh, C in assembly was a lot more fun. If you are maybe roughly my age, too, you might remember something like this. That's what it looked like. Um, you had to pick memory models and all these weird things. Um, and then I read an article about, uh, my dad is an engineer and he gets this engineering weekly newspaper every week. And there's an article about OS2 and Linux in it. And that kind of blew my mind just reading it about it. This is a, a Unix-like operating system you could run at home. You had multitasking. Um, that, just, that seemed amazing. So obviously I had to, I had to try it. Um, there's no internet back then, at least not where I lived, um, but we did have BPS service. So there is a link in there for a Swedish BPS, and I thought, that's, that's pretty close to Denmark, it can't be that bad. So I asked my dad, saying, is it okay if I download it? It's going to be probably, you know, eight hours overnight, and he said, absolutely not. Uh, long long uh, phone calls, right, were really expensive, but I, I did it anyway, and then I suffered the wrath when the uh, phone bill came in later. Um, so that was Slackware back then. Um, you know, and, and downloading on floppies, you didn't, you didn't get a lot of stuff. Uh, so I eventually found the uh, Ictrasil CD. I bought that, uh, and that uh, is what I used the first couple of years. I think it took me a couple of days to get this installed. I, um, I learned what a kernel panic meant, and I had no idea the first time I saw that, and what kind of kernel is panicking, I don't know. And uh, once I got that going and had X installed and everything, uh, it, it kind of blew my mind, right? Because programming was really different. All of a sudden now, you could just access all the memory in the world is what it seemed like. I think I had four megs back then. But that was massive. Um, you had the source available. And, uh, and that was, again, very mind-blowing. You're used to this black box thing where uh, you get what you get right in software. But all of a sudden, you could, you could see how people had made it. You could see the people who'd made it. You can contact the people who'd made it. And you can make changes, right, and run that stuff for yourself. Um, that just blew my mind. I had no idea about this open source thing back then. And uh, obviously, for me, the kernel was the coolest thing ever, right? In terms of software, it seems the lower you could get, right, the, the cooler it was. Fast forward a little bit. I attended some university. Um, didn't enjoy that very much, so didn't finish it, which my boys like to constantly remind me about. Um, and then I took a student job basically just to fund my cost of living so I can work on Linux as much as possible. So I started following LKML, um, which was even back then uh, a lot of messages every day. Uh, but it was, it was all interesting stuff, right? And, and there were all these smart people posting messages about their, what, what they were working on. And then one day, um, I've been dabbling a little bit, and I saw this guy post a message saying, hey, I'm looking for a new maintainer for the CD-ROM subsystem. Uh, because of some personal uh, life issues, right? He could no longer do it, and he was looking for new people to take over. And I thought, huh, you know, how hard could that be? I think I, I'll give that a shot. So I sent him an email, and he said, sure, yeah, you go ahead. Um, and that's how I became a kernel maintainer for the first time. So then I started working on that, um, added DVD support uh, along with a guy named Ben, uh, better support for CD-ROM burning. Right? That, was, that was big back in those days. And one I was really proud of, I enabled DMA support for doing CDDA on CD-ROM. So when you're ripping uh, CDs to FLAC files or making MP3s, right, first you got to get the audio off, and that was all programmed I.O. back then. So when you're doing that on your computer, nothing else really worked. But with DMA support, it was really smooth and in the background. And I even had a web page documenting my blogging about what I was doing. It looked something, uh, something like this and posting patches. Um, 
Working on CD-ROM taught me a lot about IDE and stories in general, since obviously a TAPI is a, a subset or, or uses ATA as the transport. So I started dabbling a lot in IDE and storage and, and SCSI. Uh, eventually got into block layer stuff, right? Because then at some point you're like, well, what ties all this storage thing together, right? That's the, the block layer. Um, so I started dabbling in that a little bit. Um, and there's some, some, I mean, just to give you an idea of back then, there's so much low-hanging fruit, right? One was DMA support for ripping CDs. That seems like that's probably worked already, but it, you know, it didn't. On the block layer front, um, we started to get machines that had a lot more memory than one gig, right? And these were 32-bit machines. We had high mem and low mem. Uh, even if your device was capable back then, you would still use bounce buffers for anything that accessed high mem. So I took that on, fixed that up, so we could do I.O. to anything the device supported. Scaling, uh, we had a single spin lock protecting the whole storage subsystem back then, regardless of the device. So we had support for that. So things scaled nicely, added some I.O. schedulers. And then um, I think we had a kernel maintainer summit back in um, 2001, something like that, 2000 maybe in San Diego or San Jose. And Oracle was complaining about all these things. And I said, well, I've already worked on all of this stuff, right? It, it works. And uh, actually a lot of that work ended up kicking off the 2.5 kernel, adding the struct bio and all those things that enable the support. And uh, then I kind of just became the block layer maintainer by default since now I've rewritten most of that stuff. So what does a kernel maintainer do? Well, they do a lot of different things. And a lot of these things I think are obvious and people know about them. Some things not uh, so much. So they help set direction for the project. When people send in patches, um, you're not only critiquing how the work is done, right? You're also making a judgment call on, does this make sense within the project? Uh, is it exposing some API should be different? Maybe all these uh, different things. Uh, they're also responsible for testing. Uh, kernel has a very, I think, interesting testing story, and each subsystem does things a little differently. Um, I, at least in my opinion, it's up to maintainer to kind of make sure that testing gets done on things. Sometimes that happens just through the, the users or other contributors in the project, uh, which is great. Uh, other times, right, it's, it's mainly on you to do it. Reviews changes, that one seem, seems obvious. Um, if Depending on how active a subsystem is, there might be a lot of active uh, contributors that are also good at reviewing patches. Um, sometimes for, for bigger changes, right, that's not the case, and at least the maintainer needs to pull some strings uh, with some people to get things reviewed. And then obviously he commits a set changes, um, and there's some decisions to be made there, right? A bug fix, does it go into this release? Does it go back into stable? Uh, do we queue it up for the next release instead? All these different things. And then you gotta deal with stable backports too. If that change does need to go into a stable tree, maybe it doesn't apply. Then you get emails from Greg saying, this failed and this failed, and then you have to take a look at it. And I've, from my experience, nobody looks at these, right? So it's really on the maintainer to take a look at them. I would love for it to be that whoever sent the patch, right, if it fails to apply, they should care enough to do the backport to 5.1 or 5.10 or whatever the stable uh, patch or tree might be. Uh, but also my experience that never happens. So I think that is largely on the maintainer to do that too. You gotta deal with the upstream maintainers, right? Maybe, maybe you're submitting things to Linus, maybe you're sending it to someone else, uh, but you gotta work with those people to get changes in their hands and in a timely fashion. Um, and that's usually done through pull request. Um, some people still use patch series, I think, but generally for sending things upstream, it ends up being pull request. And then you gotta deal with, uh, I think, finally bug reports. <clears throat> and on that topic, so what is a good and a bad bug report? This might seem like common sense, but my experience is not very common. So here's an example of something you might get in your email, right? Upgraded to this, and now my application doesn't work. I'm like, oh, that's, I'm sorry to hear that, right? But what, is, what does it tell us? Nothing really. The guy's clearly angry. Um, so that's a bad bug report, right? It's got zero details in it outside of, you know, you have at least one angry guy. So what should a good buck report include? And I'm soliciting input from the audience on this one. So what's in a good buck report? My benchmark is that you cannot answer if you give the Pixie a gold report. Yeah. If your buck report, if your buck report is indistinguishable from a Pixie jumped out from under my desk and ran away with my laptop, 
it is a bad laptop. It is a bad, well, it's a bad laptop. It is a bad bug report. Yes. So many bug reports. You can just answer, give the Pixie a gold coin. Okay. So what's in a good one? Any detail at all. I'll take that, honestly, these days. <laughs> all right. Willie? I, I, got an, I got an amazing bug report the other day. Just, just the most beautifully debugged bug report you've ever seen. The guy had gone in, he put in print case, he said, this is what it looked like before, this is what the scatter list looked like after, and clearly this, this has run off the end of the array. And I was like, oh my god, I know exactly what to do to fix this. You've put in so much work, and you, you have told me absolutely everything I need to know. If you knew just a slight bit more, you could have written the patch to do yeah. it. But you, you don't know what I know, and so you couldn't have written that patch, but you've given me everything, everything I need. And, and then need you fix it really quick, right? Because you have everything and you want to fix it. I love those where you read the bug report and you just go and type the patch. And yeah. It's, it's fixed. Even as you're finishing the email, like, oh, right, here, here's the fix. So yeah, in general, of course, you want information on what you're operating from and what you're operating to, and if this is a regression, right? You want specifics on exactly what broke. Other relevant details, the environment in there, right? The hardware used, and steps to reproduce, right? That's great. Um, best thing I can get in a bug report, um, if it's not as detailed as what uh, Willie is describing, is a reproducer, right? Somebody's saying, hey, we're running this in our production environment in this giant code base. I extracted all the details out to reproduce it. I'll show you exactly what's failing. I'm like, awesome, right? Once you have that, that's 99% of the work, because then you're just doing the fix at that point. Or you can, of course, include a fix. Yes, Jets, other will. I would like to add as well that uh, indicating uh, what is not broken can also be helpful sometimes. Because uh, when you receive a bug report, you imagine a lot of possibilities. And when the user says, uh, I tried this, 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 and they don't break, uh, it helps you eliminate a number of possibilities. Yes, for sure. Another thing I didn't put on here that's super useful is um, if people run a, a bisect, right? So they run a git bisect and they're saying, I really don't know what broke, but it says this commit and I'm very confident that that's true, right? Because once you have that, usually commits are small and it's, it's trivial to try and figure it out. Or at least string a couple of ideas at them, right? They can try. So if people are able to, um, and that's not always the case, right? Sometimes people run on kernels that are pre-built and they really don't want to be configuring and messing around with a new kernel. but if, if that's possible, that's great. And sometimes you also get uh, other bug reports or feature requests. Here's one I got. Uh, uh, Jan, Jens. Oops, where's the... Find, find a spot where I can talk. Steven? No, I want to actually bring up about the git bisect. Mm -hmm. If you do report a git bisect, please do this. Uh, if you have a especially if it's a reproducer, do it at the, um, the commit that failed. Then, you know, do it before it. I mean, just because the bisect got there. Don't stop there. Please test again on make sure that that's the commit because if one of your bisect things was a false positive or a false negative, the bisect will move all the way into something and it will claim something's wrong that's not the commit. The number of times I've been saying, hey, this thing is the failure, and I look at it, I'm like, it's a comment change. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, that's what I'm saying if you have high confidence, because that's not always the I case, want to define right? And you don't confidence. always know. Some yeah. people say, yeah, but this, I'm confident this is the way it is. I'm like, Please. yeah. <laughs> no, this, this is true. And sometimes bisect to me is even just saying, hey, I ran 641 and I upgraded 642 and it's, it's broken, right? That's probably enough information because there's not that many changes in there. So you might not have to. But sometimes you also get things uh, like this. Someone um, clearly a little entitled and that can't be bothered to do a little bit of Googling. And you also deal with that kind of stuff, right? So not just all uh, users that are happy or angry because there's a bug. It's also just a bunch of weirdos on the internet. So being a maintainer also needs to, you need to understand obviously the, the kernel rate of change and some of the things that are um, uh, result from that. So in general, as I'm sure most of you know, you get a new release every two months. So Right now we're at 6.6 RC3, I guess, right? And then we'll get an RC4 in a week. And then at the end of the RC7, generally after that, well, we'll get a final release. So the whole thing from like start to finish is about two months. First two weeks of that is the merge window, right? That's, so that's when maintainers generally send all their stuff to Linus. As a maintainer, you want to tell your contributors that I need to have, you know, don't send me things like right before the merge window, because I want things to go into my tree earlier. 
I want to make sure they get tested. I want to make sure they soak in licks next, all these different things. So that's some of the education you, you have to do and sometimes you repeatedly have to do to tell people because they always send in things in late or they forget about that stuff. Um, and then you could say, all right, so it takes two weeks, right, for a feature to get in, or two months for a feature to get into the kernel tree, right? Not obviously true. You need to write the, the change first, and then it needs to go into maintainer tree, right, and then it needs to go into release. So maybe now you're at like three months, but then it needs to get back into stable, maybe, or get into distros, right, and that could be a year, year-long process. And that, um, I always complain about kernel bypass solutions, right, people talk about DPDK or SPDK thinking that's a little bit um, a problem of the kernel uh, having failed, right? If we can't accommodate these use cases that people need to go to bypass solutions, I think it is often just the case that people think the kernel rate of changes is slow, right? It's very slow to get things developed and get them into a kernel tree, and sometimes it's just easier to do your own thing. So, maintainer fatigue. So, another thing... If you're a kernel maintainer and you do only one for a project, right, you're always, you're always kind of on, right? People email you all the time. Doesn't matter. You wake up in the morning, right, there's a bunch of emails. It's Saturday, Sunday morning, bunch of emails. It's from all time zones, right, all around the world. Everybody's working on Linux. Um, so you're, you really never have, have a break unless you just, you know, tell people I'm going to live in a cave for a month, right? Um, bugger off and we'll deal with when I get back. And then you have things like security issues, which... I've noticed conveniently always show up on a Friday night or a Saturday morning. <laughs> and now you gotta tell the family saying, yeah, no, we had these plans, right? But now I, I have to fix the security thing and then like, is it really important? I'm like, in the grand scheme of things, probably not. But now I'm thinking about it, right? And I feel like I need to get it fixed. Um, release cadence is another issue, right? Do you plan your, your vacation, your time off around when releases happen? Uh, that can be a little difficult, uh, saying, yeah, I'm, I'll be gone. You know, you can send me changes for the next release. That tends to make people somewhat annoyed. Uh, you're probably also employed by someone, which means you're at least juggling maybe one and a half jobs, if not two jobs, right? You're dealing with internal, I uh, wouldn't call it bullshit, but internal bullshit. And you're also dealing with external things, right? And um, either side doesn't know the other side, right? So that even your job and, and, and they pay you to be a maintainer, but they don't realize all the things that are involved. Uh, they say, oh, you should be on the on-call internally, right? Because we need people to fix the systems. And they're like, dude, I'm on-call like 24-7 to begin with. But sure, yeah, I'll, I'll take another one. It's fine. <laughs> are you dealing with people, right? Some people get really angry. Some people are nice to deal with. Uh, other people are assholes. Sometimes people are really nice. Same people can be assholes, right? That's, that's very different. And uh, one thing I wish I knew when I started maintaining things is what emails should I, I pick for this maintainer stuff so people can get in touch with me. I just used my private default email, which makes it even more difficult. Now you're on vacation, and then you still see the security issue come in, and now you're praying and hoping somebody else is dealing with it. That also means your phone ends up looking like this, right? You've got a lot of unread emails. This is from, I guess, Wednesday last week when I took this one. So yeah, inbox zero, when I see people post about that, I'm like, yeah. Good idea. So I would probably pick just have a separate email for this stuff. Um, that's also usually handy when you end up working um, for a company and their email system is garbage when it comes to dealing with plain text or patches. They rewrap everything. Then it's nice to have something external. So what are the solutions to some of this, right? You could build up a group of trusted reviewers that uh, kind of helped you take some of the workload off. Now, you can have a maintainer group. Some subsystems are employing this now. Um, x86, I think, is a good example um, trying to think of, of others that do uh, group maintainership, and Mimi does too, right? So they uh, take turns kind of doing pull requests. Uh, not quite sure that's working as well as, as it could be. Um, or maybe, uh, maybe just doing too much. Maybe you're maintaining too many different things, and then maybe you should give some of this stuff away. I've done that in the past. Um, one thing that I maintain and worked on for many years is the FIO or the FIO benchmarking tool. And about a year ago, I think, or a year and a half, uh, there was a guy who was continually uh, contributing to the project and answering uh, issues that were raised on GitHub. And like, why don't I ask Vincent and see if he wants to be a co-maintainer? And now he's doing probably 90% of the work, uh, which is great. Uh, but finding someone is, is generally very difficult, um, especially if you're expecting to find someone with the same work ethic as you. Uh, maybe a guy who's a prolific contributor is prolific right now, but he might not be six months from now, right? Maybe he's only prolific because his job pays him to be prolific, and now he's got a new job. 
right? So saying, setting up a group maintainership and, or picking people for that, that's what you should do and that'll solve all your problems is much easier said than done in my experience. So what if you're a new contributor? How, how do you get into kernel development the easiest? Um, all patch review done over email. Yeah, we're still partying like it's 1999. I see, um, and sometimes you're so engrossed in this, right, that it doesn't seem weird, but then you go on, on Twitter or X or, or uh, Mastodon, Fediverse, and you see people, you know, face palm and say, I can't, can't believe these guys are still using emails, right? They're using uh, GitHub or GitLab and all these fancy GUI things. Um, and they're, they're, they're probably right. I mean, I generally don't like doing review on GitHub, um, but then someone pointed me a tool saying, oh, there's these CLI things where you can pull things down, right, look at them and comment on them. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe, maybe that could work. Um, but in general now, what, what I use and what I recommend people using is B4 is a great tool. Right? It's using the lore infrastructure, which is archiving all of all the mailing lists basically on, on Voyager or Viger. Uh, so B4 is great, right? I'll pull patches down, it'll apply them for it, do a whole series, whatnot. It'll include, it'll collect acts uh, if people have reviewed patches online. Um, there's Lay, which I don't use personally, but I know several people who do. So instead of uh, subscribing to you know, tons of mailing lists on, on Viger, you can just use Lay to pull down the ones you're interested about or search for, for keywords. I think that's particularly important these days because not only are you still using email, but email seems to be increasingly unreliable. And people that use Gmail, right, there are patches they don't get or they get them with like a day's delay. And then you have the lower people saying Gmail sucks and Gmail people saying, you know, oh, we got to throttle things. And so it just makes it worse and worse. So to avoid uh, flooding your email, then that seems to be a good way to do it. And then you can use git send email uh, for sending patches. So once you have a nice series of patches, right, you can fling those out. And that seems to work, I think, pretty well. So if only email is a little more reliable, it'd be nice. Uh, there's a, even a file in the kernel telling you how to set up your personal email to send things out. Uh, the lore or the mailing system is very picky on the types of emails. Uh, everything is plain text. Uh, God forbid you have an HTML component in there. Uh, it doesn't get stripped. They just deny your email. So it can be very hard to uh, ask a newbie to set this stuff and just have it work. Right? Generally, it takes a couple of tries, I think. And then who do you send it to? Well, there's a nice handy little script for that. Scripts get maintainer. It'll tell you for a directory. Yes? When did you use checkpatch? When did you use checkpatch as well? Because it's check spelling mistakes and other stuff like that. And I'm yeah. fed up with changing spelling mistakes in error messages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. I think that is a good, uh, a good question. I think um, as a new person, you probably should run checkpatch, right? Because it'll tell you all like the, the basic mistakes you may have made. I personally think it's way too anal for a lot of things too. Right, where I'm like, I'm, I have a problem with it sometimes when people, experienced people send out patches and they look fine and someone replies saying, oh, but check patches saying like these things. I'm like, yeah, no, nobody cares about that. Oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> nobody, nobody cares about that. Yes, yeah, Steven. Yeah, uh, just want to say is check patch, as in the name says, check patch. That means patches you send to the kernel. Please don't run check, check patch on files that exist already in the kernel and then send, send patches because I get all these and I get really anal about that too when I get an email and a bunch of uh, this guys like, hey, I'm contributing to the kernel because I just ran check patch on a bunch of things and I'm fixing all these little, yeah, the, you have a, you're missing a space between the semicolon and this. Yeah. Please, it's for the patches that are coming into the kernel, not for what's there. That's all. Right. Except for staging. Except for st oh, staging. that sounds reasonable. Yeah, the staging, oh, yeah. Uh, except staging. Yeah, but staging says. to me, I don't consider it in the kernel. <laughs> <laughs> that is a dark, cold desert of the kernel. Only, only Greg ventures in there. But yes, I think that, that is a very good point. Yes, Gustavo? Uh, particularly when we are talking about new contributors, uh, staging is still a very important subsystem. So, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's great what Steve says about... Uh, uh, node uh, applying check patch on other subsystems, but for staging is still relevant, particularly for new contributors. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, help review other changes. I think uh, instead of going and running check patch on existing files, right, to fix a uh, some kind of silly error or fix spelling patches, uh, spelling errors in the kernel. 
It's much better, I think, to get your start in just reviewing other people's patches. And uh, don't be worried about making mistakes, right, or asking questions. That's generally why people are there. And people uh, love nothing more than explaining why you're wrong. So <laughs> it helps get your name established a little bit, uh, which is great, right? So when you're sending stuff, you're like, oh, I remember that guy, right? He was reviewing stuff the other day. So that, that can be very useful. So that's just one step of trying to upstream uh, uh, changes. Uh, I think the most important thing, and this sounds probably brutal, but it's true, right? Nobody, nobody cares about your needs or your patch, really. It's probably the most important thing to you because you've worked on it for a long time, or maybe it's some feature your company needs to ship, um, and you send it to the maintainer, right? And nobody, nobody seems to care, and people don't understand why. Um, but that's because it's just really important to you. It may not be super important to the project as a whole. So what are some of the things you can do about that? For me, especially if I'm submitting changes in the area where I haven't done a lot of uh, work in the past, but right? it's easy if I'm submitting stuff for my own subsystem since I kind of get to, to decide what I think looks good. Uh, not that I don't take input, uh, but try and create some shared goals, right? So saying, this is the feature, right, enabling this thing that we want to do here. I think that can be broadly applicable to other things, right, and then you can maybe massage things in such a way that it seems to cre uh, create some goodness for the project as a whole, not just for you uh, personally. That uh, seems to always help a lot. And uh, then there's another issue of nobody pays attention to your patch. And here's a sneaky little uh, life hack that I uh, find very useful. If you deliberately half-assed a change, you're going to get like five people commenting on it. Once you have people commenting on it, right, then the maintainer will see it too, and other viewers will come in. They're going to make suggestions, and then when you send B2, they've already, they have it in the back of their head, right, and they'll help get it reviewed. I'm not saying, and this, I think it's a delicate art to pull this off, because you can't, obviously it has to, if it just doesn't compile, right, you just look like an ass. But you have to kind of deliberately make, you know, uh, try and fit the, uh, the the round thing through the square peg, right? Just, just, it's just got to be a little awkward. The awkwardness will attract people. Um, and one of the worst things that can happen is uh, not, I think, that nobody looks at your patch or that everybody looks at it, right? It's, it's the in-between kind of thing. You get the maintainer reviewers replying to it and saying, ah, you know, this kind of looks okay, but I don't really like this part. But at the same time, I really don't have any suggestions for you. And then you're just like, okay, well, um, now I don't know what to do, right? I can try and kind of guess what they're talking about. Um, but it can be very difficult, I think, uh, to move on from that when you're kind of stuck in this state of we don't quite like it, but we also don't know how you should do it. Or you can have the upstream maintainer that's unresponsive, right? That's, that is a perpetual problem. And sometimes that maintainer is me, um, and sometimes it's other people. Um, but that can be very hard to, to deal with. And then one of the worst things, I think, is, uh, as a contributor that can happen is you can get Mario Karted. I don't know who plays Mario Kart in here, but there's, you can have this patch series, right? And you're, you're made it to a V10, and it's great. It gets staged by the maintainer. It's in Linux Next, and everything's looking like smooth sailing. And then two days before the merge window uh, opens, you know, someone replies saying, ah, I think, there's a, I think there's a fundamental issue like in patch three, right? I think you have to do it such and such and rewrite it. And the maintainer goes, yeah, that's, that's probably true, right? Now yank it, and now you've missed an, an, an entire release. And this, so this, if you play Mario Kart, right, this is, I think, the, the perfect analogy. You're winning the race, all the patches are upstream, uh, but all of a sudden there's this little net, right? There's this other little net, and it, just, and it just gets worse and worse until you see the finish line, we're almost there, and then you're last. Right? <laughs> And then, sometimes things are even worse too, right? You have complicated patch series. Some things, patch series are, are really trivial, right? It's maybe three changes or it's four changes. Maybe it's a single fix for something, right? Those are easy to do. Uh, but you can have a complicated patch set, things that, um, and one of the reasons why it could be complicated is because it touches multiple subsystems, right? Maybe you're touching memory management, now you gotta deal with the willy. You're also touching maybe XFS, right? And, and now you invoke the wrath of David Chinner. Um, and that can be uh, really uh, difficult to kind of hash out these things and turn it into something uh, that, that can go upstream. Sometimes that, um, you also have a problem staging it, right? Maybe, uh, maybe the MM side thinks it's just mostly MM dominant should go in here. Maybe the XFS guys are happy with just doing an act on the patches, right? But you gotta kind of work out these kinks and these details. 
But sometimes you have patches that depend on someone else's changes. I just ended up having a series like that uh, myself, right? So you're posting a patch series and someone says, oh, you should base this on V2 of the API because that's where everything's going now these days. I'm like, okay, that's good. Uh, we should certainly do that, right? Since we're doing it up front now. And then the V2 thing, right, is still in review. That's not upstream and you don't know when that's going upstream. So now you have this thing hanging, right, that's preventing you from getting your stuff in. So what do you do there? Well, obviously then you try and help this person get this upstream, right? You help review the things and see if you can get it upstream, uh, end up doing a lot of pinging in the background just to make sure things are on track, uh, just so you know and you have an expectation of when your thing's gonna go upstream. And then you have like uh, very complicated patch sets that end up in like revision 39 because they're trying to do way too much. Um, if possible, always obviously split up the changes, even if you end up having a big series, right? Maybe you can split it up into a different series. Sometimes I see big series where you have a couple of prep fixes at the beginning, right? And then there's like prep fixes spread out um, through the patch set. Maybe take all those, right? These should be trivial. Get them upstream, right? And now your patch set is much smaller. Maybe you're trying to do multiple features, right? Maybe then you should break it up um, instead to help get it upstream. So once you have all your changes and you want to send them out, oh, one other thing I should mention on this one is also sometimes people, <clears throat> excuse me, they end up respinning their patch series way too much, right? So they send out a first version of a patch series, they get one comment on it. And then an hour later, you have a V2 of the patch set. I mean, like, that's not super useful, right? Now you're just kind of spamming the list. Um, wait a little bit, you know, at least give two or three days, right, before things, um, th before there's the discussion on the existing patch set is subdued. So now you can spin a V2. That's sometimes why you end up seeing these V39 things. It's just because people are just moving too fast. And uh, it creates a little bit of chaos and confusion because now you have com people commenting on version 13 and 14 and 17 in parallel, and there's really no... Um, rhyme or reason be, uh, behind it. So a pull request uh, checklist. Well, there's some really uh, basic things, and I talked about common sense in the beginning, um, but as I always say, common sense is not so common, right? If you send out a patch, make sure it compiles. This seems like the very basic, most basic of things, but you'd be surprised how often there's a patch that's sent out that doesn't compile. Sometimes it is because somebody fat-fingered it. They did test it, right, but they made, like, a little tweak before sending it out and now it doesn't compile. Sometimes it's people running a different version internally and uh, then they try and do the nice thing and say, oh, we should get this fixed upstream, right? Because we use it internally. Um, and then they just forward port it to that new version, but they don't bother to test it because obviously they already did on the old one, but now it doesn't compile at all. Uh, so make sure it actually compiles and you test it on a version you send out. And if that's not the case, right, let people know. Let people know that this is something you forwarded from such and such, and it hasn't really been tested, but you think it, it still should go in. Uh, good commit uh, messages, really important. Um, nothing worse than a, a commit that just says, this fixes an issue in the code. And you're like, okay, yeah, probably it does, but it'd be nice to know what it fixes, right? So you explain in the commit message why you're making this change, right? There should always be a good why in here. And if it's a fix, you can use and also explain why the current code is broken. Erban? Willie? And if it's a fix, explain what the user space consequences are, assuming there is one, because yeah. that helps so much for determining what to backport. And uh, yeah, just why, why should we apply this patch? Because my my audio application doesn't work anymore. Right, because otherwise suspend and resume doesn't work on this thing or something like that, right. yeah. You can really not put too much in a commit message, almost. Yeah. I, <laughs> I said almost. I tend to ask to have the explanation of the consequence of having the patch and not having it. Yes. Because it also helps later when you face a regression and you have to decide whether to revert it or to try to fix it. Yeah. That is true. So if you need to revert at some point, it's nice to know the consequences of that, in case it's not already apparent. So uh, Willie said you can do too much in a commit message, and this is one that, uh, that I found preparing this talk. So there's a 615 lines of commit message for uh, a one-line change. So maybe this one is explaining too much. Any guesses on who wrote this? I actually hope he was going to be here. 
Um, this is why I put it in here, but he's not. <laughs> and I told him he'd be in my talk, and he was really excited about it. He's going to watch it. So I'm hoping you're, you're watching right now, Kristen. Um, and double check, right? I think lots of mistakes get snuck in because people work on something, hone it for a long time, and then right before it's time to send it out, right, they make one more little change. And then that's what breaks everything. Steven. Uh, I will actually disagree with your statement. Which one? The one that you said one line change with like a thousand lines of explanation. I found that my one line changes are the most subtle in why they were wrong. And I, almost a book report is sometimes needed to explain why that one line was fixed. Yes. And uh, I have to be honest, I didn't even read uh, all of Christian's one. <laughs> I think if you do need to write that much, you should include a TLDR in there being like, here's like the three, four line summary, right? But if you want all the gory details, here it is. I, I, I wrote a three paragraph explanation of why I was deleting a one line comment. <laughs> and I really did need to write that three, three paragraph explanation because it, it, it was that subtle about why we didn't need the comment anymore. So always double check before you send things out. And then I had to find, obviously, an example for, for that, too, that ended up in the tree. And I found one of my own from 2005. <laughs> I don't even know. There's no signed off by. We did do those back then. Um, there's a patch thing in there. I think that was common back in 2005. There's a part of the diff also in the commit message. <laughs> but yeah, it can happen. It can happen. Um, and uh, yes, uh, make clear how it was tested. I think that one should also be uh, common sense. But usually people just say it's tested, but it's always good to include in saying exactly how was this tested, right? And uh, if there's a test suite for the project, right, if it's file system or memory management stuff or AIO or something like that, right, XFS test is great to run. Um, some other projects, IURing, right, we have our Liburing regression suites run that stuff, right? That's extra brownie points, I think, from the maintainer. Um, makes it think like you've actually at least paid a little bit of attention and you, you care about testing it. Uh, and again, I think trust is hard to gain and easy to lose. When people once or twice um, have been very fast and loose, I think, with their changes, uh, then as a maintainer, you get burnt a little bit and then you get a little bit of hand shy uh, dealing with that person, right? So that makes your life difficult. And for every you know, sloppy thing that you've done, I feel like you, you probably need to do like 10 really good things, right, to kind of erase the memory of that. Right? I think it's, that's the equivalent of the leaner's yelling, right? Once he yells at you for something, right, you, you probably shouldn't do it again. And if you do, he's, he's really going to go ape shit. And write a good cover letter, right? We need to know what's the reasoning for this whole series, right? We can read the individual uh, changes, uh, but it's really nice to know your intent and your reasonings for, for writing this thing and provide um, an overview or a story. Sorry for the kind of for the pad set. And that's all I had. So any follow up questions? I think we have David who does have a pending pad set. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, I upgraded my application to 66RC3 and it doesn't work. So if you could just get on that immediately, <laughs> that'd be great. Okay. Um, all right, fine. No, but so so go back to your uh, your point about maintainer fatigue. What do you think should be the policy or like the culture of the kernel if you've been trying really hard to replace yourself or to add a maintainer, but you can't, there's nobody that can do it, and you want to go on like a month long vacation? Like, do we, like, I think the maintainer should be able to just say we're not doing anything for a month. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I'd be, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. What was that? So Greg says he agrees and wireless that just did this. What, yeah, I've, what I've personally done is I'll have, so I've got two main areas now that I'm working on. I've, I've dumped a lot of other maintainer ships, but I'm still maintaining Block and IO Uring. And on both of those fronts, right, on IO Uring, I've got Pavel down there in the back, which is perfect, right, because he's every bit as much of a maintainer as I am. So if I'm gone for a week or two, right, uh, Pavel will take, take over. On the Block side of things, there are other people that I will email. And I'll just email saying, hey, I'm going to be gone for two or three weeks. Can you please just keep an eye out for patches, right? Collect them, send them off to Linus. People that I trust to do that. Um, some of those same people on the, the block front are happy to do that, but they don't want to be a maintainer because they don't want to be stuck with that turd all the time. But they're happy to help you out when you do need it. So at least for me, that, that's been fine. Um, but having more of a maintainer group set up, I think, would be good. 
Because then if you do go away, right, it doesn't matter because then the other guy or uh, other person is, is taken over for, for that week. Or maybe you have more people and it makes it even easier. I think ARM tends to take, and somebody's probably going to correct me, but they tend to just take turns, I think, doing this, right? So this week I'm the one that does staple and patches and reviews. Um, and then next week it's, it's you, right? Thank you. Uh, I would like to go back to the uh, commit message part and to say that uh, if, you, if you know you're fixing something, that means that, uh, well, there should be... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, if, if you know you're, you're fixing something, uh, it should be a, a previous uh, commit that introduced either intentional or unintentionally the bug. So it is important to uh, look for it and include a fixed, a fixed stack uh, with, with, with that commit. And uh, also, if, uh, well, in the case that you uh, have no experience, you could also try adding, um, uh, you could also try CCing uh, stable. So sometimes uh, probably you don't know exactly how far uh, this uh, fixes has to, has to be backported, but uh, you can look for uh, in the stable tree and, uh, and if, if, the, if the offending commit uh, is there, well, you can just add to your, to your fix the, uh, the stable, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and sometimes you get emails back from Greg saying that's not how you submit patches to stable, but he's always pretty nice about it, so it's not it's not a big problem. Warbler. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I would add to to the PR checklist: check what gets through the merge window. If you submit a uh, if you sum send a patch in and it gets accepted into the maintainer's tree and then eventually gets merged, check what's actually there in the end, because I've had it happen a couple of times where. The bug fix got subtly changed, either by the maintainer or, in one case, by a Git merge with a functional conflict that didn't get noticed by Git. Yeah. And then once you realize that the kernel's been released and your fix is slightly wrong, then you have to go through the whole cycle again. And yeah, that, that's a, a good point, right? It can happen by mistake that the, the final result doesn't work, right? So yeah, you should probably recheck Linux Next or, or the first RC kernel or something like that to make sure your fix is still good. Hey, Jens, thanks for the great talk. Um, most big tech companies nowadays require a degree to get in. And you said, I think, earlier on that you dropped out of university, but you're working at Meta. And I wondered if you had any advice for people who might be you know, in a similar kind of situation. They're at university, they quite like open source. What would you say to them? Yeah. Um, well, when I, I dropped out, I think it took me a couple of years to tell my parents I, I dropped out. <laughs> And then uh, I think my parents were pretty angry with me for a while. And then I think maybe I forget when this was. Um, my dad said, uh, you know, it kind of worked out. I guess it was, it was okay. And it, it did kind of work out. Uh, I think it's all just personal. I think my main issue with the university side was that, at least in Denmark, they seem to be very adamant on the fact that everybody should be on a level playing field when you get in, which is like if you came in with any experience at all, they wanted to do Moscow ML for two years because that nobody's really done any functional programming. And I just didn't find that very relevant, so it made me pretty angry. And <laughs> I'd stop paying attention. And then I think once, once I get into something like Linux, then I just, I just throw all my time at it, right? It's just all consuming. And then I just didn't care about the study part of things. So, but, you know, I do tell my boys they need to finish their schooling. <laughs> so, I'm not, I'm not going to recommend otherwise. Paul? Uh, my co code inventor on RCU did not have a four-year degree, so what the heck, right? The what's, sorry, Paul? My co-inventor, Jack, on RCU did not have a four-year degree. So oh, there you go. Heck, right? <laughs> uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'm going to probably embarrass someone here, but a long time ago when ftrace first came out and the function tracer came out, we got these patches that did this incredible thing. It, it hey, I hook into the entry of the function and get you, like, you know, hijack the return address to give you a trace at the end of the function. And the code was really shit. And, but Ingo and I said, this is fabulous, this is ingenious, this is great. And we kept working with the person, and every time we said, could you do this, and he did a little bit more. And I found out later, the guy's not even really a computer science person. But he ended up being an extremely good programmer, created function graph tracing. So I didn't create function graph tracing, this person did. <laughs> right, Frederick? 
<laughs> I think Frederick Weisbecker. You know, and he, I think you had a degree in computer science at the time, right? Yeah. 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 So another uh, case of a very um, prolific uh, kernel maintainer without going through the whole college thing. Just wanted to. Bring I mean, obviously, out. open source makes it, it easy because everybody can see what you've been working on, right? So I think if if uh, it's, it's different than it was earlier where you only worked at a company, right? You were at IBM for 30 years and then nobody knew what you'd been doing. But these days, right, everybody can see your work. They can even see how you communicate for better or for worse. Um, so it's definitely easier, I think. And obviously computer science is not one of those things where you're cutting in people, right? So you, you don't strictly need a degree to be able to do your work. So uh, here's two more hints. Uh, first, you don't need to actively drop out, you know. Uh, it, can <laughs> it, it can happen passively. And the next thing, um, there are so many companies these days desperately looking for software engineers. So you would probably find something. I think if you're good, right, it'll, it'll work out. But who knows? We done? All right, thank you. Thank you.